next speaker, we have uh, Dr. Robert Paul. He's a professor and director of the Missouri Institute of Mental Health. His research program is focused on mechanisms of brain dysfunction and health conditions that primarily impact brain structures. His research team has developed specific expertise in human Im immune deficiency syndrome, subcortical stroke, and early life trauma as three conditions that impact the integrity of deep brain structures. And neuropsychological methods and neuroimaging techniques are his primary research methods. So thank you so much for hopping on today. I know that um, it's a little bit of a chaotic weekend for you, so I appreciate your time. It is, yes. Uh, and that's, uh, again, apologies for for being no late and um, sending everything to you late. And I'm, I'm currently <laughs> in a hotel uh, lobby uh, doing my best to uh, to manage the surround sound and uh, everything else. So I, I uh, uh, will do my best here. <laughs> sure. You could just click that green arrow and you could share your screen. Perfect. My group has been uh, involved in, in uh, research with Mastina Gravis for a number of years. And it actually was my very first um, research interest in graduate school going back more than two decades and um, and uh, ended up receiving some research support from the National Institute of Health to better understand the uh, some of the symptoms related to mental health and cognitive symptoms that individuals with myasthenia gravis had reported in the literature but really hadn't been uh, much explored in terms of science to help inform clinical practice and that, that really is the crux of the research programs that I uh, lead today is, and have through my career is, is to identify important clinical questions that, are, that really matter to patients and their families and, and that have often been under-researched um, under or underfunded even in terms of research and, and work to, to, to provide answers and, and, um, and content for clinicians and, and providers, care providers um, so that uh, we can provide the, the best just informed care possible um, and, and, um, and, and try to solve some of these mysteries that have gone on for um, many, many decades. My, my group has moved um, uh, quite a bit into machine learning and, and prediction. Uh, precision medicine is a term that folks may be familiar with, um, using artificial intelligence and um, high-level computing systems to try to bring together many different forms of data to, to create more accurate and, and hopefully more reliable uh, clinical models. And I'll walk a little bit through that, but, but try to get to the work that's most relevant um, to the presentation today for Mastina Gravis. Um, in terms of general outline, uh, brief introduction, a little bit of, of characteristics about immune diseases that influence mental health. Uh, as the frequency, as we know from studies that have been conducted in some recent research on the frequency of mental health symptoms uh, among individuals with myasthenia gravis. Um, questions about uh, mental health as a predictor itself or as a mechanism that, that could exacerbate uh, myasthenia gravis uh, disease. That's a question that is um, an interesting question and one that is often on the minds of, of patients and families. Um, I'm going to introduce, if you haven't heard of this book, uh, it's been around, I think now it's in its third edition, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, and we'll talk a bit about um, the differences between uh, chronic stress and, and, and chronic diseases and, and acute stress, and then um, uh, uh, how this fits into the current pandemic of COVID um, and the interactions and syndemics that uh, are potentially operative in this really unfortunate and, and, um, and uh, uh, stressful time. Uh, and then also talk about evidence-based strategies that, that support mental health and, and um, uh, leave with some really positive opportunities for us to um, to to all maintain mental health for ourselves and our loved ones as best we can. Um, again, especially during this this time that's a very unusual time of the COVID pandemic. And then, of course, um, happy to answer any questions as as they come up. And I should have asked: Is everyone are you able to see the screen? Okay. Is a, is the full presentation showing? Uh, am I, can you hear me? All right, I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with that you can hear me. And flip. Sorry, we can hear you, sorry. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Didn't mean <laughs> to leave really your mind quick, dry. <laughs> really quick introduction. Uh, this is my, my organization. I, I, I lead an organization of about uh, 70 
researchers. Um, we have three main areas, clinical brain science, addiction science, and prevention science. Our, our goal overall is, is to shorten the time that, that uh, exists currently and has existed for a long time between scientific discovery and clinical implementation. Um, for, for many years, that, that gap has been um, almost a, a, a 12 to 13 years from the time that new ideas, new information, new discoveries are created um, in the lab or in, in the field, and then they're actually brought into clinical practice and, and, and their scalability and uptake and implementation. And, and of course, that's, a, that's just too long. And, and so in, in some contexts where they're, especially in terms of pharmaceuticals, of course, that's a different, um, there's a different context there because of, of the, the need for safety and, and, and assurance that, that there's not going to be harm in addition to proving um, efficacy. But, but for a lot of, of, of uh, approaches that we use in the, in the mental health sciences, um, behavioral approaches, uh, we don't need the same degree of, of that evaluation. And so the opportunity exists to, to um, be more efficient in our process and use better methods um, that, that can allow the science to get into the clinic in a faster approach. Um, as mentioned, we, we use a number of different methods and uh, Nicole mentioned our, uh, we, we use an imaging, we, we look at cognition, we look at mental health, we look at immunology, we look at epigenetics and genetics. We try to fold in as many different dimensions of health as possible. The idea being that if we can integrate data from multiple aspects of a person, we have a better whole person approach to, to clinical science and to clinical uh, care. Um, and then we, we put all of this information that we get as you see here on the left side, we put this into these computer systems that have become very popular from Amazon and Yelp and Twitter and all the social media accounts. Those are all based on these complex mathematical algorithms that, that now can predict when we wanna buy a shoe before we figure out that we actually want to buy the shoe and we get advertisements about buying shoes when we simply send an email about our shoes. Um, these are all coming from these predictive algorithms and, and our group has been working in this space for the last decade to take these algorithms and enhance them and also make them uh, appropriate for the use in the clinical sciences. And the idea being that we can kind of figure out all these interactions that exist. Um, and most of our methods that, that we as scientists have relied on for many years are really not capable of addressing these interactions. And it makes sense that, that for all different individuals, we have different uh, barriers, we have different challenges, we have different levels of, of stress, we have different levels of support, um, and all of those interactions, how all those kind of net out to an outcome is going to differ for, for one individual to the next. And so we need different methods that can account for that and, and then hopefully model that, predict that, understand that, and then provide us with information that we can use in the clinical setting to better understand individuals that may be at risk for some um, particular outcome, whether it be uh, mental health symptoms or cognitive symptoms, or, or um, individuals that are in a, uh, have certain strengths that they can leverage to offset or mediate those kinds of risk. Um, and that's really the goals of, of this research. And in terms of characteristics of neuroimmune diseases that can influence mental health, I think this is a, a really interesting area because we, we all generally know things like if we are stressed out um, we're, we're prone to getting sick. We might uh, feel like we have the flu or a cold if we've been um, really stressed out from work or from our health. So I think in the, in the general public, we have a pretty good understanding that there's a, a linkage here. There's a connection between how we feel mentally and how we will feel physically. And um, we now know after uh, a lot of, of um, debate <laughs> that, that these are linked and, and that there's pathways that, um, that exist, and this is a, a diagram that I, I don't expect everyone to, I can't even read it myself, and I'm the one that put it there. Um, it's, it, this, the font is too small, but really the goal is to show that there's a lot of interactions in the biology between brain and, and the body, and much of this is uh, that's described in this uh, schematic is, is um, these interactions that exist between a stress response when we feel mentally stressed and, and our immune system and then how the immune system circles back into the brain and um, the, the, the markers that exist on the immune cells um, carry a long-term memory about these stressors. And so there's this cycle that exists 
um, that involves inflammation and stress, and it's um, described as bi-directional. It's the, the mental health can affect the immune system, and the immune system can also affect the mental health. Um, although I'll just raise some caution that I think that the, the strength of that relationship is, is much higher on the mental health affecting the immune system than perhaps the immune system affecting mental health, but that is still an area of active debate. Um, but um, in, in terms of certain characteristics of immune diseases that make mental health really challenging is, is one, the, the fluctuation. The fluctuation of symptoms, the fluctuation of severity, the uncertainty of what's going to happen in the future, um, which is, uh, it's, it's never clear, uh, for example, if it's going to be a good day or a bad day, if uh, some factors are going to make symptoms more intense or um, going to interfere with our, the, the kinds of activities of daily living that are important to us, whether it be interacting with friends and family, being able to go to a, a social function, uh, engage in our hobbies, all the things that we need to do really that support our, our positive mental health cycle. And as those things start to get more and more interfered with um, the, over a, a long period of time, then of course uh, it, it becomes a, a, a foundation for, for for stress and, and, and depressive symptoms. So, um, of course, any health condition is a, is a predictor of, of mental health challenges, and that makes sense. I think that's something that we shouldn't spend money on research trying to understand. I think we know that. Um, what we understand also is that in immune system diseases, whether it's HIV or if it's lupus or if it's uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, or if it is a myasthenia gravis, or any of the, the conditions that have an immune uh, base to this, there's really some dynamic changes and fluctuations and uncertainties that make the mental health even more challenging. And we know this also from a long history of research about the importance of, of being able to predict when stress will come. If we can predict a stressful event, we are much better capable to manage that in an effective way. If we aren't able to predict it, then that particular event can have much more dramatic effect in terms of our mental health status. And uh, I, I used to draw this, uh, these studies out on a, on a chalkboard when I was teaching back in much younger years. And uh, I used to draw these, the, the, the rats on, on a chalkboard that students always said they looked like corn dogs. So I wasn't a very good artist. But the, these studies that go back many years that show that if a rat if an animal can predict when a stressor was coming, um, they were going to develop much fewer ulcers than the rat or its partner that didn't have an ability to predict because it didn't get a signal like a light or a sound um, to, to get the same shock. So those, both animals would get the same stressor, a mild shock, but only one would know it's coming. And the one that knew that it was coming would develop fewer ulcers. And that's st those studies have been replicated many, many, many times. So we know that that Prediction is part of control. It's part of our mental control. And being able to predict uh, what's going to happen allows us to, to embrace ourselves and, and, and form uh, active coping skills and, and really adaptive coping skills um, to get through that. The, the other thing is, is that, that makes these conditions particularly challenges is the chronicity. And, and we'll, we'll circle back on this when we talk about the zebras. Um, the, the, the chronic stress uh, and the immune system, the responses that, that evolve from that, those are, those are very different than the uh, single episode or acute stressors, particularly of mild form. So chronic disease, um, particularly chronic disease with some fluctuating symptoms and symptoms that can really impact uh, active, active engagement in our social uh, environment, th those are ones that will likely increase the risk of depressive symptoms. Um, and, and in fact, we see that in their studies that have been published for a number of years that, that um, not very different from many other kinds of conditions that there is a higher prevalence of depressive symptoms. There's a higher prevalence of, of anxiety and stress among individuals with myasthenia gravis. It's um, roughly two to three times more frequent than what we would see in a general population. Um, those numbers are, are probably different now in the, in the COVID era. The, these particular data that I'm sharing from one study uh, were actually collected before COVID, um, but published in the COVID era, but nevertheless um, collected before the COVID pandemic. And, and what we do know in some terms of some predictors are that individuals with an earlier disease onset uh, and, and with more disease severity tend to have a higher frequency of the depressive symptoms. 
So that again is, I would say, not remarkably surprising in terms of what we understand in terms of the challenges that are in front of individuals with myasthenia gravis. Um, and, and, uh, and then oftentimes there's the question about to what degree does myasthenia gravis or does the mental health conditions that are associated with myasthenia gravis actually make a condition, the condition or the disease worse? We, we do have evidence from, from some uh, other conditions and HIV is one of them. Um, we, uh, we, we study a, a, a large cohort of individuals with HIV that have been infected for only 30 days and we've been able to measure all their immunology and their mental health status over um, the course of about 11 years. And, and, and these individuals, when they have stress, mental stress, they are actually more likely to have um, virus in their, in their system, even though they're taking medications to keep the virus completely suppressed. If they're less stressed over time, you'll see fewer episodes of that virus um, kind of re-emerge re into the bloodstream. So we have um, some evidence there from one condition that there's a correspondence between fluctuations in the, in the mental state or the health of the um, depression and anxiety symptoms, and then also whether or not that allows the virus or the disease to become more active. Um, there's some evidence that it's uh, coming from the myasthenia gravis literature that individuals report uh, more exacerbation of symptoms after having mental stress. And again, this kind of fits that general narrative that where we say um, in the general public, we know that if, we, if we're stressed out, um, we're, we're more likely to have an immune response that would lead us to have um, some sickness. So it wouldn't be too surprising um, uh, if, if uh, there's some interaction here that goes back to that first diagram that I showed. Um, and so when there's one study that's uh, uh, been published recently that, that looked at uh, a positive association between depressive state and, and uh, risk of relapse um, and, and in terms of symptom severity among individuals with myasthenia gravis. Um, and individuals that had higher levels of, of baseline stress at the time of the study onset, um, higher levels of anxiety were more likely to also have more relapses. Um, but, it, but at the same time, we know that, that um, those who relapsed uh, with treatment also had higher disease severity at baseline. And so um, it's, it, it's hard to know exactly that it is um, the, the depression that's causing that relapse or the stress that's causing the relapse. I would say it's probably too simple to attribute that to just those particular conditions. It's possible that, that these are all kind of interrelated concepts, um, that individuals with higher uh, d disease severity at baseline are the same individuals that have the higher stress and the higher depression. And so really allocating or, or figuring out exactly which of those different conditions or, or predictors are really triggering the relapse, it's, it's hard to, to tease those out. And that's why we use these more complex models that, to try to understand those interactions better. And that's work that still needs to be done. So I, I would say it, it, that overall, there's, there's uh, uh, clear evidence that, that as any condition that is uh, going to affect, likely going to affect engagement and, and social activities and, and life, that there's an increase in depression and anxiety, um, especially when there's uncertainty and, and fluctuating symptoms. There's some evidence that that may be related to um, triggering additional symptoms, but again, I would be um, cautious in over-interpreting that uh, and, and say that we have more work to be done, particularly given this connection to baseline disease severity. I mentioned zebras and ulcers, and, and the reason, I, I don't know, again, if, if individuals have read this book from Dr. Sapolsky, uh, but this is an interesting um, theory that, that describes the difference between really many animals and, 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 um, and humans, and that is that um, many animals, when they have faced stress, they face a, a very acute stressor, one that is short-lived. And in our lives, we, we face very chronic stressors. And, and this appears to, uh, well, it's been described as kind of the new um, modern plague, that it's something that's really continuing to evolve. It's between work stress and family stress and our health stress, um, and now we have the pandemic stress, um, and this kind of coalition of all of these things increasing, um, it, it seems that we don't have many days that, that are free of stress. Whereas the, the zebras, they might be challenged by a predator, but they run and then it's over. And so um, we know from a lot of cardiovascular literature that um, it's how quickly we can, we can get back to our baseline cardiac function after a, an, a stressor of our cardiac system is how quickly we can get back. That's a good measure of our kind of viability. 
And on the mental health side, we, we don't have very many chances to get back when we have just chronic um, repeat, repeat um, stressors. And, and of course, a chronic disease, myasthenia gravis, where we have um, symptoms that we're going to be wrestling with or individuals wrestle with, um, th that is something that that is a, a chronic stressor with us every day. I, I myself do not have myasthenia gravis. I do have an autoimmune condition that um, gives me some challenge on a daily basis. And so I understand that um, that that general concept, but of course, for individuals with myasthenia gravis, as with any particular condition, um, there's a lot of disease-specific issues that that really uh, only the patients really understand. But um, for us, the chronic stress issue is is really a challenge. And and um, what what's what's come out as kind of key factors to help bolster against the chronic stress. I'll give you a, a few bullet points, and then kind of go back to the COVID issue. Um, having an outlet for frustration is really important, and this relates back to social support. Um, a sense of predictability, I mentioned that in terms of control and understanding what's, what we're facing and what's coming at us. Um, that pr human, the human brain and the way that we're set up as a, as a culture and as a society, it really benefits from predictability. The control, as, as mentioned, is part of that prediction. An optimistic outlook is really important, and hope in particular is in uh, one that has become uh, a, a kind of a darling child of the research literature lately, and the differences between optimism, um, especially uh, making sure the optimism is realism um, and hope, um, and keeping those, um, you know, it, in check in terms of, of being present with reality, but, but, but having um, the opportunity for, for good things to happen in the future. Um, and then all of this really kind of wrapped up in social support. And I'll mention a little bit more about that in um, a subsequent slide. COVID has been a game changer in lots of ways. And there's actually a new introduction of this COVID stress syndrome. Um, and it has these uh, multiple kind of uh, components to it that, that have affected everyone. And for individuals with chronic diseases, and I, obviously myasthenia gravis would be among those that we would be uh, focused on here is is this syndemic interaction between the stress of the COVID syndrome or the COVID uh, pandemic, and um, and and whether it is being at risk of of having greater disease severity or not being able to have access to treatment or care, or um, if you do get sick, if there's going to be a stronger immune response. Um, the, the, there's a number of different uh, components to this. The social isolation has been a big concern um, with, uh, with COVID. And we know that some of those same um, immune cells that are involved in the stress response, that, that first slide that I showed of all the different connections, some of those immune uh, cells that are really important in the stress response are the same immune cells that are, that are um, very abnormal in individuals that do get COVID that have a big um, immune response and, and have a, a challenge in terms of, of viability and, and, and even if they're responding on a breathing uh, apparatus, they may they may still not have a very good outcome if they have a big cytokine or immune system response. And so some of those are the same cells and uh, interleukin-6 is one that we've been focused on quite a bit because it's a very important uh, stress hormone or stress cytokine, I should say. It's not a hormone, it's a cytokine. Um, and that, that immune cell is, is um, also known to be involved in, in kind of that big cytokine storm that, that we see in individuals with, with COVID. So, so there is a lot of stress about um, that, that's COVID and, and COVID of course has been long. I mean, it's, um, I, I'm sitting in a long empty hallway of a hotel um, and only, the, only because of that, I don't have my mask on, there's no one nearby. But um, the, 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 the concern of, of this, and this, this sequestration that we've been through for, for a long time now is, is really unparalleled in, in most of our lifetimes. And so um, we, we, we see increases in alcohol use and drug use. We see increase in, in depression, anxiety in the general population during COVID. Um, some of the reports are showing the increases of, of, are in double digit figures. And, and so there, we, we don't have a lot of data yet about the interactions with these COVID related um, stressors and, and health outcomes among individuals with chronic disease. Those are studies that are just now getting really started. Um, we're involved in several, and, and I know uh, many others are as well, and, and we'll be learning a lot, I believe, about um, both factors that, are, that help protect and serve as resilience, 
sometimes the treatments that individuals are taking are actually serving as resilience against these mechanisms that are that are triggered by the COVID uh, pandemic, and and um, uh, that'll be a very interesting uh, result. But but we unfortunately just don't have much information there now. So I I, I think that we, we we don't have the data yet to talk about exactly what these interactions are. But I, I just wanted to bring into the context that we we really can't talk about mental health in a chronic health condition today without introducing the concern or at least the, the realism that, that COVID has been a game changer for, for our, um, our society for a long time and is a clearly a, a, an additional chronic stressor. Um, I, I, I'll just talk a, a bit about some evidence-based strategies. I talked about those particular bullet points and we'll, we'll revisit some of these here. Um, social support is, is usually one of the most powerful um, uh, protecting factors against uh, depression and anxiety. And um, this is a, a, this graph here, this is called a heat map on the right here. And I'm just showing, this is an interesting outcome from a study that we're, we've uh, now submitted for publication, looking at, at whether or not um, individuals with relational problems, they have low social support, um, or if they have high social support, if they have a, any way of protecting against um, a history of, of child abandonment as, a, as an early life stressor. And um, what, what we see is that really independent of, of child abandonment status, which is of course a very significant early life stressor, individuals that have relational problems that don't have good social support, they are much more likely to be uh, non-responsive to treatment for anxiety. This is a treatment study for anxiety and, and the blue is actually non-responsive. And, and individuals that are that have any degree of, of relational problems at all, um, it, it leads to this non-response. So it, it, this is very consistent with many, many other studies that, that show that, that having a social support system, and this can come from many different kinds of, of sources. It can come from friends, it can come from family, it can come from um, church and, and faith-based or organizations. It can come from um, clubs, organizations, uh, support groups, that the more the better. Um, and, and the, the more deep and real, the better. Um, but it is, it is kind of this, uh, the, the, one of the most natural, most, most impactful um, uh, protecting agents that we have for mental health. Some other studies uh, or, or mechanisms that, that, that we've actually studied, uh, we've looked at mindfulness, as many others have as well, or meditation, relaxation techniques. Um, and it is, uh, self-care is, is uh, really critical in um, whatever the practice is, having a, a, an opportunity to um, to engage in, in um, some form of self-care is is really critical. It, and we see in, improvement in immune system as well among individuals that follow a relaxation or meditation kind of approach um, on a, on a regular basis. And that's really the key is is having a regular basis to to and taking the time to prioritize that um, to to really genuinely engage in that. Um, exercise, and uh, this is another one that uh, is, is important, of course, for conditions like myasthenia gravis, this may be more challenging in terms of the type of exercise and aerobic exercise in particular. So uh, it's, it's all about balance and, and understanding what the opportunities are and, and not, um, not pushing oneself to a point where fatigue is now becoming, uh, we've made it worse and we're exacerbating symptoms um, so this is one that we, we recommend, but only when appropriate and, and, um, and uh, can be managed well. It's oftentimes about the kind of exercise itself that's being done. Obviously, vigorous exercise um, is a personal um, and, and medical concern for in some individuals. Um, just a real quick summary uh, that for, for everyone, we would recommend that, that uh, have that outlet for frustration. Um, uh, do your very best to understand and, and have prediction in, in terms of, of the things that we can predict and control versus the things that we can't and really work to understand those differences. Uh, again, for, for individuals with neuroimmune conditions or immune conditions, um, that may not be as, as, um, as, as easy as it sounds, and I appreciate that. Uh, um, but we, we should try to always do our best in terms of maintaining control over those things that we, that we at least we can. And, and keep that optimistic outlook with, with hope and, and, of course, realism in terms of that optimism. Um, that is one of the keys in, in terms of depressive 
situations where individuals that do kind of lose that that sense of hope, um, it's a it's a tougher climb to get back to a, that that baseline where things are 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 back in in control, um, and and uh, do our very best to avoid pulling away from social support. If and in the COVID era, that may mean more online time or or um, Zoom time or or whatever the uh, the mechanism is, um, the, the key is to avoid full disengagement um, and, um, and and maintaining that our networks as best we can. Behavioral activation in some form or fashion, whether it's um, aerobic exercise or meditation or um, relaxation techniques, but this behavioral activation is, is one that we're becoming more and more aware of as being a, a kind of a natural way to offset depressive symptoms and anxiety symptoms. Um, and we're currently doing a, we're running a study to look at the uh, positive impact of behavioral activation uh, on a traditional anxiety treatment program, knowing that, that the depression and anxiety symptoms, they, they, they tend to go together. Um, and oftentimes depression is one that follows chronic anxiety. Um, and the behavioral activation is a great way to, to uh, increase all of the positive uh, hormones that are flowing through our, our brains and our bodies and also to, to um, uh, leverage the social support and, and engagement in, in our, um, our our networks. Uh, and as mentioned in, uh, many times, we want to maintain control where we can um, with recognition that it's not always possible in some uh, scenarios. But um, uh, where we can engage that, we want to we want to do our best. And with that, I'm I'm happy to answer any questions. I, I um, hope I didn't go too fast, but I'm um, uh, happy to answer any 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 questions. One of the things is that, that um, one of the comments came in and they said, you know, they do kind of feel like a lunatic at times. So it's kind of nice to know that, you know, they're not alone in that situation where, you know, stressors magnify everything and, you know, just being in a whirlwind of being, you know, in this flux of a diagnosis too, that in and of itself can cause a lot of stress with someone's life. So there's always ups and downs. Um, All right. So I do not see anything that came through. Thank you so much for your time today. You're welcome. Thank you.